So, in chapter 6 here of Judges, we see this very familiar story of Gideon. And, you know, basically, just to give you a little bit of insight and background in this story, you can see from verse number 1, it says, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. This is the time of the Judges, right? This is in between um, when Moses brought the children of Israel out of Egypt and when the kings were set up. So just the time frame of the Bible and history, what's going on here. They've already been brought into the promised land. You know, Joshua is dead. Joshua's, you know, Mo Joshua picked up where Moses left off. He finished fighting all the battles that they had to fight to inherit the promised land. And they're living there. So at this time, they're living with a government that was the one that God had ordained, where they basically had judges over them and they had God's law. And they're basically just supposed to follow God's law and keep his commandments. And, um, and this was before they ever had a king reigning over them. So what happens is there's always this, this, this same pattern where they're doing good. You know, they were doing great when Joshua was alive and when his whole generation was there and all the people that had seen the miracles that God had done and bringing them out of, out of Egypt and fought the battles and all this other stuff. And then they pass away, and then there's another generation that, that, that arises, and they forsake God, and they do evil in the sight of God. And it goes back and forth. So they start doing evil, and then God brings judgment upon them, and you know some of the heathen in the, of the land will come in, and, and they'll take over, and they'll start ruling over them, and then they'll, get, you know, they'll cry out to God, they'll go back, they'll wake up and be like, God, help us, we need your help. And they start relying on God again, and then God sends a deliverer. He sends, you know, oftentimes it's called a judge or a deliverer, somebody to be a leader to, to help lead them back out of their wickedness and, and into following God and righteousness again. So here in chapter 6, that man is, is Gideon. And this is a man that, that God chooses to, um, to bring them back into righteousness. So verse number 1 says, The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So because of that, he delivers them into the hand of, the, of Midian. Midian's just one of the heathen nations that are around them. And basically what happens is the Midianites, the Amalekites, and these other countries are coming in. They're, they're kind of just bullying them. You know, they're taking their food. You know, they're growing crops, and they just come in, and they just take it. So they're just being, um, you know, cast down and, and, and impoverished because all their wealth, all their store, everything's being, being taken away. And when we catch up with Gideon, he's threshing the wheat, and he's doing it behind the wall. He's like, do it in secret because he doesn't want anyone. He's the one the Midianites to see him that he has this food because they're just going to come and take it. Yeah. And this is, these are the things that they had to do in those days. And, um, you know, a, a prophet was sent unto, unto Israel. And it says in verse number 8, it says that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus said the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all that oppressed you, and drave them out from before you, and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. So what he's saying is that they are fearing these false gods, and, and when they're fearing them, you know, they're often just worshiping them. They're, they're taking on themselves these false gods and these idols and the gods of the people that were around about them. They're, they're forsaking the Lord and they're serving idols and they're serving these false gods. So an angel comes and speaks to Gideon and basically tells him, you know, you're going to be the savior of the people here. You're going you're to bring them out and, and get rid of this bondage because they had turned unto God then at that point. They're, you know, they're crying unto the Lord, Lord, help us. You know, basically, we're sorry, you know, help us out here. We're being oppressed. And um, Gideon's first, and you see how humble he is. And, and most of these great men of God, you'll see that, that great attribute, that, like Moses had, you know, Gideon has it here. He was a humble man. He says in verse 13, Oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us. First he's questioning, and this isn't, this isn't where it's humility. Is. First he's saying, you know, wait a minute, if God's with us, then why is all this stuff happening to us? And he's saying, you know, where are all these miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? And he's kind of, this is kind of a poor attitude because he's just doubting. And this is the way I think a lot of that generation had that type of attitude. Well, where is God? You know, oh, there's this great mighty God and he's our God. 
And, you know, you can see Christians today saying the same thing, or people brought up Christians, right? Not necessarily believers, but just, you know, oh, I hear about this God. We, we hear about this God in, in the Bible who, you know, they parted the Red Sea, and he didn't always want to go, well, where is he? What has he done lately? You know, it's been 2,000 years. And um, that's what the Bible says people are going to be talking about in the end times, that um, people say, oh, things have been continuing the same way they've been, you know, and, and they're going to be basically mocking God by, by saying, well, where is the God? Where is God? You know, we're, we're doing all this wickedness. I don't see any problem. You know, we're doing what we want to do, and I don't see God coming down and doing anything about it. But he is going to come back, and he is going to bring judgment. But that's way outside the scope of the sermon. Um, so Gideon here, he's saying, you know, well, you know, we've heard about God, but, you know, if he, and he's saying, if you're, if you're saying he's with us, then where are the miracles? Like, why, why are we seeing this stuff if God's really with us? Why are we being afflicted? It says in verse 14, And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? So he's saying, look, you are going to do this. You know, you're looking for, for, you know, where are the miracles and stuff. Well, I'm sending you, and you're going to do this. And it's funny, because people are always looking to someone else. Right? This is what Gideon's doing. He's saying, well, I'm looking around, and I don't see anyone else doing this. They're all being afflicted, but nobody wants to step up. Nobody wants to take charge and say, you know what, I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to do what's right and, and become that leader. He needs to, to be told to do this. But this is the same mentality that everybody has. You're always looking for someone else. I, I'm looking for someone else to help me out of this mess. And this isn't something, an attribute that we really want to have. You know, any good leader is going to say, you know what, I'm going to step up. I'm going to take charge and I'm going to you know, help lead our people out of this mess that we've gotten ourselves into. And we need a lot more men like this today to be able to take charge and to rise up and to rise the occasion and not be looking around and saying, oh, I wonder where, you know, I wonder where the next, uh, you think about it, we're talking about this today, our movement, you know, this great movement of, of these great churches being started and hopefully we'll, we'll have them all over the place. Yeah. Well, it's not going to happen if people are just looking around and saying, well, I wonder where the next one's going to start from. I wonder where it's going to be. Hey, you need to decide to step up. You're, if you are in the position, if you're qualified, obviously if you're not qualified, you can't take on that role. But you can help to get it started. You can encourage others. You know, you can you can do a lot to still help the process instead of just sitting back and looking around. I mean, it's the same thing with soul winning. You know, you don't want to be a part of a church and looking around and just saying, oh, great, you know, our church got this many people saved, but you're not doing anything for it. You need to say, or maybe you're in a church and there is no soul winning going on. Say, man, I wish somebody would step up and start doing a soul winning time. Well, why don't you do it? Yeah. And that's happening all over the country where there's people who, and, and I've talked to people, they want to go out, so they want to do this stuff. Well, look, step up and do it. You're not going to be perfect at it. You may fail. You may flounder a little bit. But look, if it's something that needs to be done, step up. God will use you for that. Don't wait around to see when someone else is going to come along to lead you. You've got the Bible. You've got the Holy Spirit. You're saved. You've got the Bible. You know, that should be enough. Listen to God's calling and do what he's commanded us to do. It may be more difficult than other people have, and I'll give you that. Okay, it may be harder, but you still need to step up and rise to the occasion. So we see Gideon here, and God tells him, you know, I'm sending you. You're going to do this. And here we see his humble attitude, verse 15, he says, he said unto him, O oh my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. You say, well, who am I? What do you mean I'm going to, you know, he's calling him a valiant man of war, you know. He's talking to him and saying, look, you, Gideon, you are going to lead this people. You are going to de deliver them. And, um, I mean, God's going to deliver, but he's, he's saying that he was going to send him, um, to save, to save the, the land from, from the Midianites. And um, God tells him, it says in verse 16, And the Lord said unto him, and this is what we need to remember, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. If you're just thinking about physically your flesh, or what, what you're physically capable of doing, and you're relying on your own talents and abilities to do this great work that God has set before you, 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 you will fail yes. if that's all you're relying on. But if you have God with you, you know, if God be for us, who could be against us? When you have the power of God upon you, look, I never imagined that I would ever pastor a church 
that I would ever get up and preach in front of people. I dreaded it, and it was, it was mortifying to me. And if I had to rely on my skills, because I, I don't have very good skills at public speaking and things like this, is never anything that came easy for me. I have to rely on God completely to be able to do and perform the task that I have before me. And, and you might say, well, you're not a very good preacher, Dave. But, <laughs> but regardless of that, of, of, you know, if that's true or not, I have decided to say, you know what, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to try to fill the gap and I'm going to do this. And look, this isn't to bring glory or honor to me. I'm just trying to use myself as an example and say, look, you should do the same thing. This isn't some aspiration I've had that ever since I was a kid, you know, I knew I was going to be a pastor of a church or anything like that. No, there is a need. There's a drought. There's, right. there's, there's a need in this land for people to step up and, and to not be looking around for someone else to do this. I remember we'd go around, we'd visit other churches, we'd go on vacation, and it'd be okay. But there's always something lacking. It's like you just wait, like, come on, preacher, like, just say it. Say the truth. Just, just hammer it home. Yeah. Preach the truth. You want to hear it. And it's just, just not really happening. And I could sit there and be like, oh, man, that's, you know, that's a shame. It's just really not to make good churches. Or I could just decide, you know, I'm going to do something about this. Do I meet these qualifications? Yeah, I do. I'm going to talk to the pastor, you know, whatever. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to start following this route because this needs to be done. And in, in America, in these days, there are a lot of churches that, that need to be started. And people need to stand up and fill that gap. And um, so we see here... Gideon's humble, though. He said, you know, look, look, who am I? Like, I'm nobody. And he's right. He is nobody. And God, but God likes to choose people like that. So I look at myself, look, I'm nobody. I don't have any skills. I can't do this. You can do it. Not in your own power, though. Yes. You need to rely on the power of God to do it. And that's what we need to do is rely on the power of God to do anything. Whether it be if you're shy, I don't like talking to people. Man, I'm scared to death of going out and knocking on some door and get people saying, hey, look, don't rely on yourself. Rely on the power of God. If he's with you, you can do it. And he wants you to do it. And it is in God's will to go out and, and win people to Christ. So there's no excuse you have to say, well, I don't know if he wants me to do it. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. I'll answer that for you. It's, it's, it's clear from, from the word of God that, that he has given that assignment for everybody who's saved to go out and win more people to Christ. And um, so he asked for a sign and, and, and on and on. And then, um, what, it's funny, this is all by way of introduction, by the way. What I want to focus on in this story is what he tells them to do. Excuse me, let's start reading again here in verse number 25. The Bible says, And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it. And build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock in the ordered place, and take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove, which thou shalt cut down. So God's giving him an order here, and he's saying, look, this is what I want you to do. There's this altar of Baal that's set up. There's this, this satanic altar is set up. I want you to, to tear that altar down, and I want you to build an altar unto the Lord, and you're going to offer a burnt sacrifice on that altar. We're going to get rid of this Satanism. We're going to get rid of the false gods right now, and you're going to do it, and I want you to tear that down. You're going to make this statement. You're going to stand firm, and you're going to make clear to everybody that this is not going to be allowed in our nation anymore. You're going to go and tear that altar down and get rid of it, and build up and alter them to God. This is what he's telling them to do. So let's see what he does in verse 27. It says, Then Gideon took ten men of his servants. This is a big task. That's why he tells them, he tells them to bring an axe, like an, an ox, or an ass. He tells them to bring that so that he can use that to, to literally tear down this great altar that's been built up and to pull it down. So he takes ten men with them and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was, because he feared his father's household and the men of the city, that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. So he's a little bit afraid, right? I mean, this is something, this is a, a very important artifact to people at that time. I mean, it's religious. It's what people go to and they think they're worshiping and serving God. So, I mean, imagine today if you were to go to, the, to one of these you know, Mormon temples or whatever and, and just tear down and destroy the temple and bring that down, how angry 
the Mormons would be for you doing that, right? I mean, that, that, would, be a, that would be a big deal for them. I could understand why you might be a little bit fearful and be like, uh, let's do this at night. So he doesn't, he, you know, he doesn't, uh, he, he doesn't go against God's commandment at all. He still, he still obeys and he does it. He doesn't just get scared and run away. But he says, you know what? I don't think we're going to do this in the daytime because I don't know what's going to happen. Let's just go and do it. Night. So he does it and he tears it down. And of course, exactly what we would think has happened. People are upset. They get mad. And they go and notice that this, this altar was his, it was his father's altar. Like this is, his, this is dad's altar. He's going and, and, and tearing down. Verse 28 says, And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down, and the grove was cut down that was by it. And the groves were something you see all throughout the Bible. In addition to these altars that are set up, it's a place, the high places, the groves, are all things they created to worship and serve false gods and false idols. Or even if they were worshiping God, it was in a way that God had not told them to do it. It was, it was um, ways that they had picked up from the heathen. These, God never said anything about creating a grove or going into the high place ever one time. But that's how the heathen worshiped their false gods. And sometimes that was mixed in with serving the Lord. Sometimes it was just still there for serving the false gods, which is the case in this, in, in this case. They're serving Baal, and, and they would build up these groves and, um, and have these altars. So he cuts down the grove. It says um, at the end of verse 28, And the second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. And they said one to another, Who had done this thing? And when they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, had done this thing. So... Even though he did it at night, they still knew who did it, right? Um, someone, someone saw what was going on that must have made quite a bit of noise tearing down that altar. Verse 30 says, Then the men of the, of the city said unto Joash, Bring out thy son that he may die. So they're upset. They want to kill him. They're saying, look, get your son out here. He tore down this altar. You know, we're going to put him to death. Now, what I'm preaching on this morning is throwing down the altar of Baal. Okay, and we're going to make other applications with this. But you see here, God tells Gideon, I want you to tear down this altar. You need to go do this. He knows the impact this is going to have. He knows that people are going to be threatening for his life, yet he still does it. And throwing down an altar of Baal, even in, in our days, and we'll, and we'll try to make some applications for how this could be applicable for us today, but you can get people very upset when you decide to throw down some of Baal's altars because people are so ingrained into worshiping Satan and they don't even realize that that's what they're doing, but they're, it's, it's such a, a big part of their life that they're going to be willing to kill and that they're going to be maddened and angry at the things that you say or the things that you do, and, and it could make them mad, literally just, just really extremely angry at you and mad like crazy mad at you for what you want to do like they did with Gideon, but we need to trust in the Lord. And that's where we get our strength from, and we need to be able to trust that, hey, God's able to deliver us. God is able to protect us. Did Gideon die in the story? Absolutely not. They wanted to kill him, right? But I love what his father said, too. And you got to imagine what kind of an impact this had on his dad. You know, so oftentimes you have family members, and you're afraid to say anything about what they believe because you don't want them to get upset. You don't, you don't want to throw down that altar in front of them because you know how much they love that altar. And, and, and Gideon could have been having these same thoughts, saying, well, Dad really likes his altar. I mean, he built this altar. This is, this is something that he really likes, and he worships on this. And I know it's wrong, but, but this is what he does, and I don't want to offend him. But look at the impact it had on him. He didn't deliver him up to be killed. He didn't say, you're right. You know what? He's got to die because... You know, this is an altar to our God. Maybe this is the thing that he needed to have done in his own life to get right with God or to get saved or whatever. I mean, we don't know that much about his father, but you, you got to look at what he says. I mean, because this is, this is where um, Gideon even gets a new name based on what his father does. He says in, uh, so we're reading verse 30, he says, Bring out thy son that he may die, because he hath cast down the altar of Baal, and because he hath cut down the grove that was by it. And Joash said unto all that stood against him, Will ye, so Joash is, is Gideon's father, right? Joash said unto all that stood against him, Will ye plead for Baal? Will ye save him? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death whilst it is yet morning. Now this is, this is amazing type of boldness that he has in speaking to these people 
about the altar that, that was his. That was, I was on his property. I was like, this is his altar. And he's saying, look, if you're going to plead for bail, then you should be put to death. If you're going to answer for him, um, he says, if he be a god, talking about Baal, let him plead for himself because one hath cast down his altar. He's saying, look, if Baal is really a god, then why doesn't Baal just come and strike him dead? If, if this is such a big thing, and, and if Baal really, he should, be, he should be doing this himself. And the people listen to that. He says, therefore, on that day, he called him Jerob Baal, saying, let Baal plead against him because he hath thrown down his altar. And that just kind of quells the crowd. The crowd goes away saying, okay. You know, <laughs> and, and obviously God's hand is in that just protecting Gideon from that. But Gideon gets this new, new name of Jerob Baal. Obviously, Baal there is, is, is referring to the altar of Baal that he had thrown down, the altar of the false god. And um, Jerob, say, uh, you know, and translating apparently here um, would have something to do with him. Let Baal plead against him because he had thrown down his, his altar. I don't know the exact translation of that. But obviously the meaning of that name is given to us right there. Um, that he, he received the name. And he's referred to now oftentimes throughout the, throughout the Bible as Jeroboam and Gideon because of this act that he had done. Now, there are times in the Bible where you'll have these leaders. And this is why I kind of went so much into the leader aspect early on in the sermon. We need men of God and people need leaders. So there's, there is definitely a lack of it, but... As human beings, we need somebody to kind of take up the torch and, and to try to lead in a righteous direction. And we need, you find many stories throughout the Bible. We're going to look at a few of them. If you would, to 2 Kings, while, while, while I'm making this point, 2 Kings 11, we're going to look at a few examples of these great leaders and men of God who have decided to cast down these altars of Baal and to get rid of that wickedness, and to make a bold statement, and to do something strong, and say, we are not going to allow this. This wickedness is not going to be accepted anymore. And we need to have that line in the sand where we're going to say, you know what? When people start putting up an altar unto Satan, like I think they did in Oklahoma, and saying that this is going to be, no. We're not going to stand for that. Someone ought to go and cut that thing down and stamp it into small pieces and put it in the brook Kydra because that's what needs to be done for it. Say, we are not going to stand for this. I don't care if you, you know, oh, but our religious rights. Look, we're not going to, we're not a nation of devil worshipers. We're not going to stand up for this. We're not going to allow this. This is not who we are as a nation. I do not want the wrath of God coming down upon us as his people because we're allowing Baal, images to Baal just to be set up. And just because this person, these people, this group of people is Church of Satan or whatever, they think it's just a big joke, and they're just really just a bunch of atheists, and they're just a bunch of trolls trying to, trying to pick fights with people and trying to do things that are, you know, just trying to get people's attention, and, and, and basically they think that anyone who has a religion is stupid, so they're, they're picking these things just to provoke people. And this is, this is ultimately what most of this stuff is about. It's like, well, we're going to really use this, you know, freedom of religion to, to, to offend as many people as possible. And they think it's all a joke anyways. And they're all just a bunch of fools that say in their heart that there is no God. Amen. They have no respect for God and, and, the, um, and the wrath that they're bringing upon everybody. By, by rearing up these, these altars and these figures and these, these idols unto, unto Baal, unto Satan. We need the strong leaders, these men of God, to do bold things and, and to say, this is the direction that we're taking. And, and oftentimes, you know, a good leader needs to be able to do that and say, you know, follow me as I follow the Lord. And, 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 and to make these strong stands. So that people can, can get shaken up and we'll say, oh, wow, okay, well, we need to choose a side. Now something, something happened here. When that altar is thrown down, now all of a sudden it comes to a head. You have to pick a side. Before that, it's, you could be kind of wishy-washy and oh, you know, whatever, yeah, they're doing everything. Well, as soon as an event like that happens, okay, what are you going to do? Are you going to be against him or are you going to be for him? you got to pick a side. There's no more being on the fence about it. And these are all events that happen. We're going to look at Jehoiada. Jehoiada was a priest in 2 Kings 11. Look at verse number 17. 
It says, And Jehoiada made a covenant between the Lord and the king and the people, that they should be the Lord's people, between the king also and the people. And the, all the people of the land went into the house of Baal and break it down. His altars and his images break they in pieces thoroughly and slew Matan, the priest of Baal, before the altars. And the priest appointed officers over the house of the Lord. So here we see, um, you know, and in context there was the, that wicked queen that had all the heirs to the, to the throne killed. And um, it was Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, that slew all, the, all of the heirs. But one got away, and um, Jehoiada, the priest, was protecting him. And basically, you know, is, is kind of rearing him up because he was a young child when he was when when all this happened. And uh, he basically waits to a point, I think he's like eight years old, when um, when what was his name? Jo Joash. Joash? It was, yeah, it was when Joash was made king. Um, so he waits until, until you know, he's like eight years old. And then he finally brings him out and says, okay, you know, we're going to get rid of this wicked queen. We're going we're gonna to set things right. We're going to do a reset button. And in all of these stories, it's like a reset button. It's like, you know, the children of Israel have been doing wickedly. They've been doing wrong. They've been worshiping other gods. They've been worshiping these idols. We're going to get things back on track, and we're going to do it in a very serious way, in a very quick way, in a very just definitive way. And say, okay, the queen's going to be killed. We're going to break down the altars of Baal. We're going to get rid of the sodomites out of the land. We're just going to clean house and start fresh and start serving God. And we see here, it's what um, verse 18, it says, the people of the land, so the people of the land follow this. They were waiting for that leader to come along and someone to say, look, this is what we need to do. And people say, yeah, you know what, you're right, we do need to do this, and they, and they act out on it. But this whole time, until somebody steps up, until someone kind of takes charge and, and takes the lead, everyone's kind of sitting around going, oh, you know, I wish someone would come and, and, you know, we could do this. And that's what people are doing today, like, you know, waiting that there's going to be this righteous president and we could have somebody to finally lead our nation. That's not going to happen. The whole system's corrupt. Yeah. If you're waiting for that to happen, yeah. you know, good luck. If everything's been bought and paid for already. So, so waiting for a righteous man to arise in, in our wicked political system, Jesus Christ, I think, is going to come back before that happens. Amen. But um, we see here that they break down. They go into the house of Baal. They go into this, this, this false God's house. They break it down. They break down the altars, they break down the images, they break them in pieces thoroughly. I mean, they destroy it. And they even, they even kill the priest, the Baal, before the altars. And then it says, and the, and the priest appointed officers over the house of the Lord. So they get right with God. Let's turn to 1 Kings. You're in 2 Kings. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 18. We're going to see what Elijah did. I love this story. You know, let's see how much time we have. I'm going to have my first page of notes. Um... We'll, um, I, I, I want to read this story, but we'll skip over some of these other examples that I have of men. Because this, this, I, this is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. I love what Elijah does here. And you got to remember here, okay, Elijah is another man of God. And he's a great leader, but he feels alone, right? You remember with Gideon, he knows these people are going to be so upset they're going to want to kill him. Yet he still obeys God. Well, Elijah is basically in the same boat. And not only that, he's, he's just like alone. I mean, he's got nobody on. He feels like he's got nobody on his side. Yet he's still doing these things that God has commanded him to do. And you know, serving God, you, you may come across some times where you feel that way. You feel, man, there's nobody with me. Nobody believes the same way. I, you know, I, I feel like there's nobody out here that does this. And you feel all alone. Hey, look, if God is with you, you've got, you've got the majority right there. And we need to trust in him that he, we don't need to fear and fear what other people are going to think, do, or say unto us. We need to just stay strong in the Lord. But we're in 1 Kings. Let's look at uh, 1 Kings 18, and we're going to start reading in verse number 17. It says, And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, 
I have not troubled Israel, but thou in thy father's house, and that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Baalim. Baalim is just the plural word for Baal, just mean many false gods, many devils. And um, we see the same pattern over and over again, right? The people are doing evil, they're worshiping false gods, so then they get, you know, um, they come into, into straits, they come into to troublous times, and they need someone to deliver them. Verse 20, 19 says, Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. 850 of these other prophets, of false gods, of these devils. He's saying, bring them all over here. And then there's him, Elijah. Talk about being in the minority, right? Let's get all these false prophets out here, and then I'm going to be here to speak for, for the Lord. And they're all going to be, you know, calling on their God. And let's see what he does here, verse 20. He says, so Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel, and gathered the prophets together on the Mount Carmel. So he, he listens to him. He does this. Verse 21. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. So again, we get to this point. There's a decision that needs to be made. Don't halt between these two positions. Look, look if, if, God, if the Lord is God, worship and serve him. And if Baal's God, then worship and serve him. But don't be on the fence about this. You need to make a decision. And, and the people, they're wishful. They don't say anything. They, they're just silent. It's like, okay. And this is how so many people are today. Yeah. That's why we need more strong leaders to cast down that altar of Babel to make people make that decision. Verse 22, let's keep reading. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under it, and I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under and call ye on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. Then all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves, and dress it first, for ye are many. And call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under it. So he's saying, okay, we're going to offer up a sacrifice. So there's two bullocks here. Choose whichever one you want. Go ahead. You guys get to go first. Choose the one that you want. You're going to cut it up in pieces. You're going to put it on your altar. And call on your gods. Don't, don't put any fire under it like you normally would. But we're gonna, you're going to call on your god. And the god that's able to just, to just consume that, that, that offering without you doing anything for it, that's the true God. This is the test we're going to do. And he says, go ahead. There's 450 of you. Do whatever you need to do. Call, you know, call on your gods. You know, put them here. And, and let's see what happens. I, I love Elijah's attitude through this too. You'd be like, oh, that's not very Christ-like. Well, <laughs> Elijah was a man of God. We see what he does here. This is, this is a great story. It says in verse uh, 26, And they took the bullock, which was given them, and they dressed it and called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. So they're calling out from morning until noon. And then they start jumping up. They're like, come on, Baal. you all like, we're here. Like, we're trying to make a big noise. Like, like oh, Baal, hear us, you know. Verse 27 says, And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he's in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awake. He said, like, oh yeah, wake up your God. You know, he's, he's, he's overslept. You gotta, you gotta call, scream louder, because, you know, then maybe he'll wake up out of his sleep and hear you and, and take your altar. And he's just totally mocking him. And let's just see what they do. It's verse 28 says, and they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lances till the blood gushed out upon them. And this is one of the signs of a false, wicked religion. It's, it's yeah. bizarre, it's perverted, it's twisted, where they literally will be cutting themselves, thinking that they're showing their devotions to their gods when they do this self-mutilation, saying, look, God, I'm bleeding for you. And they think that this is going to make their false god answer them because they see their devotion. And this wicked, this is twisted, this has been going on forever. But you see it even in the news. Um, 
the, those two girls, I forgot what state it was in, they, they murdered, they, they attempted to murder, they murdered one of their friends, and it was, they were trying to show their devotion to this fictional character that doesn't even exist, like a boogeyman, a slender man or something he's called, and, and they were doing this to show their devotion as such a perverted, twisted act, and it's, he was built up in their minds, he was a false god. He was, a, and they were trying to do this sacrifice for them, and, um, and it's bizarre and wicked, and we see that these people are doing the same things. Immediate sign of a satanic religion when, when part of the religion involves cutting yourself and making yourself bleed out for, for that, God, that God or that devil to listen to you. Um, verse 29 says, And it came to pass when midday was past, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. So from morning until the time of the evening sacrifice, they're doing all this stuff and hooping and hollering and jumping on the altar and, and cutting themselves and doing all this stuff. It says that there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. And Elijah said unto all the people, come near unto me, so gather around, right? And all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. So say, we're going to set up this altar again. It's been broken for way too long. We're going to get this right. We're going to set up the altar to the Lord. Verse 31. And Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the son of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar, as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order, and cut the bullock in pieces, and laid him on the wood, and said, Fill four barrels with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, Do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And the water ran round about the altar. And he filled the trench also with water. So he gets 12 barrels of water. He says, just keep dumping it over. Get the wood completely soaked. Get the meat, everything, the whole offering. Just get it completely drenched and wet. And that trench that he built all around about the altar, that also he filled up with water. He's just saying, like, we're going to soak this thing. Because you guys need to understand that there are no hidden tricks up my sleeve that I don't have some, some way of making this, you know, this fire being kindled or anything that, that you're going to say this isn't the Lord. He's saying, we're going to settle this right now. Let's just dump a whole bunch of water on it. And you love the confidence that he has in the Lord, too, because he knows that God is going to listen to him. He pours all this water on it, and then it says in verse 36, And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. He's doing everything according to the way that God had told him to do it anyways. Like, it's the evening sacrifice. This is something that God had wanted him to do. He's not making up some new sacrifice. It's the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. So he came down, he consumed everything. He's just like, whoosh, and just, and just everything is completely um, consumed by the fire of the Lord. And when the people, when all the people saw it, verse 39, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is the God, the Lord, he is the God. Now, that's an amazing event. And, and obviously that's a point where people are going to say, you know, this, this, we're going we're to follow God. Now, we may not have a miraculous event like this happen in our lifetime when, you know, when we're throwing down the altar that we need to throw out in our lives, but, um, it still needs to make people come to that decision, whatever it is that 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 altar that's in our life, or or that's you know that that's going to be um, something that we have to throw down, no. ought to be something where it's going to make people make a decision to serve God. And um, we see what happens here then too in verse forty. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. And so he kills them all. And this is a big, um, a big event that happens there. And Elijah was that man of God to get people back on track to serving the Lord. Um, this happened with King Ezekiel. I'll just read this for you. Second, well, 
Um, yeah, we're in chapter 18, just we're going to look a little bit earlier in the chapter, verse number 3. Is that right? No, we were in 1 Kings. Okay, never mind. You don't have to turn there. It's in 2 Kings. I'm like, that's his word. 2 Kings 18, 3. You don't have to turn there. King Hezekiah basically does the same thing. It says, And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. He removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. King Josiah, we mentioned him this morning. He did the same thing in 2 Chronicles 34. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 12. That's where we're going next. I'll just read this story. I don't want to spend too much time here. I kind of spent a lot of time on Elijah. 2 Chronicles 34 says, For in the eighth year of his reign, 2 Chronicles 34, 3, For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David his father. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. And they break down the altars of Balaam in his presence and the images that were on high above them. He cut down in the groves and the carved images and the molten images. He break in pieces and made dust of them and strode upon the graves of them that had sacrificed unto them. And he burnt the bones of the priests upon their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And so did he in the cities of Manasseh and Ephraim and Simeon, even unto Naphtali with their mattocks round about. And when he had broken down the altars and the groves and had beaten the graven images into powder and cut down all the idols throughout all the land of Israel, he returned to Jerusalem. Again, a really strong statement being made of we are not going to allow this at all. We're going to break it down. We're going to stamp it. We're going to destroy it to where there's nothing left. And it's just completely unrecognizable. There's going to be nothing left for you to go back to. This, this Satan worship is going to be gone out of our land. We're not going to, we're not going to allow this anymore. Um, you're in Deuteronomy 12. We're going to see God's commandments. Because this is everything that they're doing here is commanded by God for them to do. This was something that they, would, they should have done the whole time. Obviously, they never allowed this to happen. But in Deuteronomy 12, we see where God commanded them to destroy any remnants of the wicked nations, gods, and um, that, that they were going, when they were going into the promised land, all this other stuff, God's, um, God's commandment was to destroy these things so that they, they weren't there to be a snare unto them. Verse uh, number one of Deuteronomy 12 says, These are the statutes and judgments which ye shall observe to do in the land which the Lord God of thy fathers giveth thee to possess it all the days that ye live upon the earth. So these are, these are commandments that they're supposed to do. Verse 2, ye shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which ye shall possess serve their gods, upon the high mountains and upon the hills and under every green tree. And ye shall overthrow their altars and break their pillars and burn their groves with fire. And ye shall hew down the graven images of their gods and destroy the names of them out of that place. This is a part of the law, apparently, that people didn't really want to follow that much. They just kind of looked past this and read past this. Yeah, yeah, no, we kind of like the way that they worship their gods. We're going to incorporate that into the way that we serve the Lord. No, God was serious about it. He says, I want you to utterly destroy. Don't leave any artifact, any remnant of what they did in serving their false gods. We don't want that to corrupt and pollute your mind and to start thinking that, oh, this is the way that we should serve God. No, God tells us exactly how we should serve him. And... Look at verse number four. He says, You shall not do so unto the Lord your God. Verse five, But unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name there, even unto his habitation shall ye seek, and thither thou shalt come. So they made all these places, these high places, these hills, you know, the high hills and the mountains, and all these places that they designed to, to worship and to serve their gods. God says, Don't go to any of those places. You need to go to the place that I shall choose. Now, back in the Old Testament, there was the temple. There was the tabernacle. And there were these places where God had chosen to put his name there. Well, now in the New Testament, we have local churches. So the question that people need to be asking themselves is not, what's the best, what, what church do I like the most, that, that best fits my personality, where I'm going to make the best friends and do all this other stuff? You ought to be thinking, What's the church that God wants me to be in? Right. Where is the place that God wants for me to be? Where is the place that is, that is preaching God's word, that's teaching God's truth, and that is following the Lord with all their heart? 
That is the church that you need to be getting into. You don't need to be looking at, well, what kind of activities do they have for teens? You know, I've got children. And I can't go to that church. They, they don't have anything for my toddler. You know, they, well, this doesn't really fit my schedule. I need, I need to just find another church. No. What church does God want you to be in? No, this, right. is the, this is the, the criteria that we need to use in, in as far as where we ought to be. It's the place where the Lord your God shall choose, not, not where you choose. Jump down to verse 13 of Deuteronomy 12. Furthering to the point, it's, he says, Take heed to thyself that thou offer not thy burnt offerings in every place that thou seest, but in the place which the Lord shall choose in one of thy tribes, there thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings, and there thou shalt do all that I command, command thee. And we live in a society, in, in, in a, Christian, a Christian world today, or a Christian um, community of people who will say, well, God just cares about your heart. He doesn't care about these little details, you know. These are the people today that will be like, oh, yeah, go worship the Lord in the grove. He doesn't care if it's in his house or if it's up on that hill. You know, if you feel better doing them up there, hey, God knows your heart. Just go ahead and do that. And this is the attitude that Christians have today. Like, these things don't really matter. Like what God said, said, no, I want you to do it this way. Oh, he's not that, he's not that strict. He's not that, he just cares if you're, you know, if you're in your heart, you're doing it for the right reasons. That's all he's going to care about. No, it's not. Amen. Right. Now, is your heart important? Absolutely. Your heart is more important than just about anything. You know, how you be heart. Absolutely, that's important. But that does not mean that he just ignores, that all these things that he tells us to do and all these commandments that, eh, they're just suggestions, really. I, you know, you can do them or not, I don't care. As long as I think that you love me, then that's good enough. No. No. God has his word for a reason, and God's very specific about the things that, that, that he lays out for us and says, this is the way you're going to do it. If you're going to serve me, if you're worshiping me, it's going to be this way. It's going to be my way because I'm God. This is the way that you do it. This is how God thinks and how God speaks, and this is how he talks to us in the Bible. It's not going to be any other way. You know, with Moses, you're not going to put any strange fire in there. This is the incense. This is the way you're going to make it. This is the way the tabernacle is going to look. I'm going to tell you the colors. I'm going to tell you, you know, how you're going to connect it together. I'm going to tell you how big it's going to be. I'm going to tell you where the doors are going to be. I'm going to tell you how everything is laid out. And this is the way I expect it to be done. And if it's not done the way I want it, then what happens is people end up dying as a result. When, when people transgress God's law, I mean, you, when, when Aaron's, the priest, the high priest, Aaron's sons decided, there I am, we're, we're going to offer up this, you know, it's not what God told us to do, but we want to give them this, you know, this um, incense, yeah, the strange fire that he put before the Lord. God killed them. It's not what I told you to do. No reason to be upset about it. Look, I told them, they knew. You heard my words. You think I was joking? No. This, we got to respect God and respect that the things that he says for us. We can't be letting the devil creep in with all of his devilish ways to, that we should be serving God. And that is, by the way, the way that a lot of, a lot of even righteous men, you, you see the righteous kings and stuff, it says, but they didn't get rid of the groves. But they didn't get this, you know, they, they didn't quite get rid of this stuff. Now, were they worshiping and serving the Lord? Yeah. Were they doing good? Yeah. But it was still sin. They still should have gotten rid of those things. And God pointed that out and said, you know, they still didn't do this. And it's not good that they didn't do that. And look, I don't want to follow God partially. I don't want to say, I don't want God to say, you know, he did all these good things. You know, he's overall he's a good guy, but he did these other things that, you know, or didn't do these other things. No, I don't, I don't even want to have that, that marker. I want to be like, no. You know, this man, he's, he's upright. I, want, I, would, I would to God that, that I could live in a way that he would talk about me like he talked about Job. Or he talked, you know, and I'm not saying that I'm like Job. I'm just saying that that's, you know, this is what we ought to be striving for is to be like, you could, God could look at you and be like, you know, he's a righteous man. He is the most righteous man on the earth and he's, and he's living a good life. Okay, he's, you know, he's obviously not perfect and he's still a sinner, but he's not, doesn't have any of these major sins or, any, or whatever in his life. He's doing a good job and I'm pleased with him. And I'm happy about what he's doing. I don't want to have any mark come up and say, yeah, he was pretty good, but he didn't do this. He failed here. I don't want to have that. And um, God wants us to follow everything that he has for us. Now we're going to see how, um, well, I'm going to skip past that. I have a whole point here on how the altars get set up to bail in the first place. 
And it's basically this attitude, this mindset of people that they either give up on God or they trust in a man. They want lower standards. They don't want the consequences for their sin. So they kind of make up their own idols and make up their own God. And they set up these altars. I was going to read this story and I'll just kind of go over it real briefly where Moses goes up into the mountain, right? And then the people are like, well, what happened to Moses? He's up there for four days. Before. What happened to him? Oh, we don't know what happened to him. So they go to Aaron and they're like, yeah, we don't know what happened to Moses. You know, we want you to make us gods. Why don't you make gods for us? And Aaron does. He, and he, you know, he makes this golden calf and he says, you know, these be thy gods. And then all of a sudden what they're doing, they're, it says they, they ate and drank and they rose up to play. And Aaron made them naked. So, so they're having these, these parties where they're, they're eating and drinking and, and they're naked. And, and it's just a total shame. And they just and instantly are just going after false gods. And they're saying, you know, make us these gods. And they know that it's not God. They're, I mean, he's pulling it. He's taking this, this metal, all these earrings and jewelry and things, and he's just, oh, it oh, looks like a calf. Yep, here's your God. How stupid is that? This thing I just pulled out of the fire. Oh, look, here's your God. And they don't care. It's because people in this mindset just, they just want to do what they want to do. They want to follow the flesh. So they say, I don't care what it is. I want to have this feeling like I'm doing good. I want to have this feeling like God is, is okay and satisfied with me. So I'm just going to make up a God so I can just go out and sin and live wickedly and have no consequences for my actions, but I can still feel spiritual as if I'm yeah, serving God. That's right. And this is the mindset that people have, and this is why they get set up in the first place. It's, it's out of the wicked heart of man. And what did Moses do, though, when he came down from that mountain? As a proper leader, as a good man of God, did he say, oh, well, I guess they want to you know, worship and serve these false gods now. Okay, well, I'm going to go worship the Lord. And, you know, they can have their false gods. That's not what he did. He got angry. Yes. He took the false idol. He, he, he stamped it. He burnt it in the fire. He ground it into powder. He put it in the water, and he made the children of Israel drink it. He said, you're going to drink this. How dare you make these false gods and try to serve them when the Lord brought us up out of Egypt, when he's done all this for you? Give me that idol. Break it into pieces. Drink this. Drink this wickedness. Get this out of here. That's the way a man of God's gonna gonna react and gonna behave. And this is the type of men of God that we need to have in this country to, to, to get rid of the evil as we we're talking about this morning. So we get this country to repent and make people choose and say, who are you gonna serve? Are you gonna serve the false religions of this day? Are you gonna serve Satan? Or are you gonna serve the Lord? Are you gonna get right with God? We need to get this garbage out of our life. We need to start throwing down these altars, throw down the altar of Hollywood that's corrupting and perverting the minds of the youth wow. and, 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 the, and the adults and everybody and just teaching you that wickedness and sin is okay. We need to throw down so many altars. It starts off with, with first getting yourself in that right church, the church that God has chosen for you. We need to bring the right sacrifices. Because think about an altar. You know, they're breaking down these altars. And the altar was designed for a sacrifice. Right now, we don't do animal sacrifices today. But there are sacrifices that we need to make in our life. The Bible says in Proverbs 15, it says, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. You can, people could be making sacrifices that God looks at as an abomination. If you're doing wickedly, God doesn't care about what you're sacrificing. God doesn't care about the money you're throwing in the plate that might be a big sacrifice to you financially if you're living this wicked lifestyle. He wants you to obey him and to listen first. So obey is better than sacrifice. God wants you to do that. But if you're going to bring a sacrifice, do it right. Get your heart right with God. Get right with God in your life. Get the sin out of it. And then bring your sacrifice. The Bible says the sacrifice of the wicked is, abom is, an, is abomination. How much more when he bringeth it with a wicked mind? Romans 12, verse 1, tells us an acceptable sacrifice that we can give unto God. Romans 12, verse 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy. Holy means you're set apart. You're not like this world. You're set apart unto God. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Look. God's not asking something unreasonable of you. 
He's saying, look, it's reasonable for me just to ask you to be holy, to be set apart, not to be like the wickedness of this world. Look, present your body as a living sacrifice. Say, God, here's my body. I want to serve you. Help me to do that. You can use my body. I'll take my body. I'll walk out, and I'll go, and I'll talk to people, and I'll show them the love that you have for them and what you did for them when Jesus Christ shed his blood for them. Here's my body. Use me, God. Here's my voice. Take it. Use it. It's for you. I want to bring honor and glory unto your name. This is the proper sacrifice that we need to be bringing, but it needs to be to the right altar in the right church, the right place. You need to be amongst God's people. Not just some fun center that you think, well, this is going to be so much fun with all these activities for my kids. No. Go to the place that God chooses to put his name there. Verse 2 of Romans 12 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He said, don't be conformed to this world. The world is a bunch of Baal worshippers. Yes. The world is going to get you to, to, to go to their altar, to go to the altar of Baal. We need to cast down that altar. Get rid of it. We need to be transformed. It's going to start by the renewing of your mind. Get your mind right. Get your heart right. Get in God's word and don't compromise and allow this wickedness into your life, into your home, into your community. Get it out of here. Say, we're not going to stand for this. There may be a bunch of other wishy-washy people who are, who are looking for the next leader. You know what? I'm going to stand up and be that leader. I'm going to say, you know what? Follow me. If you're just waiting and sitting around, hey, choose it. Are you going to serve God? Or are you just going to sit at home and just watch TV and let, and let life happen all around you and let a bunch of people go to hell? What are you going to do? Or are you just going to go out and serve Baal? Hey, if you're going to serve Baal, then go out and do it. But if you're going to serve the Lord, let's get it done. Let's do it right. The altar of Baal represents everything that is satanic and evil. And this is my last point. I'm going to close with this. As with all of Satan's most effective deceits, he's going to make it look good on the outside. He's going to make things look as close to the real thing as possible. He's going to make it so that people can say, oh, this is good. Hey, this is a good religion. This is Christian. This is good for me because it's, it's, it's similar. It's kind of close to what God's intended, but it's not, it's not quite right. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 12. We're going to close with this the last section we're going to turn to because we're going to see that Jeroboam was able to get all of Israel to worship his false gods because he made it so similar to the Lord. And this is so many people are deceived today into going and worshiping at the altar of Baal because they think that it's God's altar and it's not. And, and, and it's a deception and Satan is very good at what he does. But it's a deception. That's all it is. Satan's a deceiver. He's out to trick people. It's just, and, and we see Jeroboam. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, 1 Kings chapter 12, he's always referred to as kind of the standard of a wicked king. So people say when, when there's a wicked king that comes along, they compare him to, well, how wicked was he in comparison to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that made, that made Israel to sin? Because what Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, did was very wicked. He was a very, very wicked king in introducing these false gods, the other, right off the bat. I mean, the kingdom's just barely gotten started. You had King Saul, King David, King Solomon, and then right after Solomon, it splits. So you got Rehoboam, and you got Jeroboam. Verse number 27, we're going to read this order, we'll close with this. Verse 27 of 1 Kings 12. If this people go up to do sacrifice, this is, this is um, Jeroboam thinking, you know, What's going to happen? If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold, and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So he did exactly what Aaron did. He just made these false gods. He said, Behold your gods. Here they are. These are your gods. And he set the one in Bethel, and the other put he in Dan. And this thing became a sin. For the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. And he made an house of high places, and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month, on the fifteenth day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. And he offered upon the altar. So did he in Bethel, 
sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart, and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel, and he offered upon the altar and burned it. So because Jeroboam is worried that he's going to lose the kingdom, and he's going to lose his position, and he's going to lose his power, he decides to go against God, which God's the one who ordained for him to become the king. God's the one who sent the prophet and said, okay, you're going to be king. He turns on God and says, I'm worried about losing my position and my power, and they're going to come and kill me if they continue to worship the Lord where God told him to, to worship the Lord. So he sets up these calves. Dan or Bethel is okay, wherever's closer to you, you go to Bethel, you go to Dan, whatever. And he makes priests, right? The house of God had priests, but they were priests of the Levites. See, he changes. He says, well, we're going to take the lowest of the land. We're going to take these, these derelicts or whatever. We're going to make these people the priests. But we have priests. You know, dear, you go, if you went to, to Judah, if you went to Jerusalem, you, have, you go see the priests there. Hey, we've got priests too. You know, come, this is closer. Come here. Oh, they had a feast? Yeah, yeah, don't, don't go to that big feast. Look, we're going to have a feast too. Look, our religion, look at this God. We have, a, we have a feast too. It just so happens to be on the same exact day. The 15th day of the 8th month. See, you have no reason to go over there. Just stay here. We've got a feast. We've got priests. We've got sacrifices. We've got altars. Hey, we're going we're to offer up these bullocks. We're going to offer up rams. We're going to do all these things. It's so similar. Yeah. And the outside world can look at that and be like, oh, it's the same thing. And it's not. They're two completely different things. One is an extremely wicked sin of worshiping false gods. And the other one's not. You remember in the, in the days of Hezekiah, you know, um, the king that was coming up against him was saying, you know, Hezekiah, don't listen to him. Don't, don't, don't trust in the Lord. The Lord's not going to save you. They're saying, Hezekiah's the one who broke down your altars unto the Lord. So why is God going to save you? Because he had no comprehension. To the outside world, when Hezekiah got right with God and he broke down all these altars of Balaam and, and, and got people back on track with serving the God the right way, the, the world looks at that and says, he got rid of your churches. He got rid of, you know, of, of your God. You know, like, he's not, don't, you can't trust in the Lord. He, he got rid of that. He's against that. They, they have no comprehension. They can't discern or see any difference. They see the fake Christianity and the real Christianity, and they have no idea. There's what people today will look at, you know, Catholics and Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and Baptists and say, oh, yeah, they're all the same. They're just Christian. It's like, what? No. Not even, not even close. Not even remotely close. Right. Huge difference. One of them's right. Mm -hmm. The rest aren't. And the rest are worshiping and serving, you know, for example, Catholic Church, they're idols. And they're false gods that they set up in their house. And, and it's, it's not a house of God. And they're, and they're doing the wrong thing. Look, we need to throw down the altar of Baal. Don't let it influence you. Don't let it creep into your life. We need to be able to make that strong stand that these men of the Bible did. Because as, you know, this ties in perfectly with this morning's sermon. Our country needs to repent. Our country needs to change. Somebody needs to step up and, and say, we aren't going to allow this. And like I said, you can't necessarily change the whole world. You may not be a king. I mean, these kings that allow power and influence to say, this is the direction our country is going to take. This is the direction that we're going to go. We're going to serve the Lord. And as a king, I'm going to command for all this stuff to be done. We're going to be done with it. They had the power to do that. And I'm not going to wait on some president to come and do that. That's right. So where do we have influence? Locally. What are you going to allow in your community, in your area? What are you going to put up with? Hopefully your community doesn't have anything that wicked, but you know, when the altar of Baal starts to get reared, we need to make sure that we're first to throw that down. Yeah, that's right. And not allow that to creep in and say, no, we're a Christian community, we're a Christian nation, we're going to serve the Lord, and we are not going to have his wrath come upon us. And we're going to lead, we're going to follow, say, you know what? We're going to bring it to a head. And we're not going to let this vocal minority continue to push and to push and to push their agenda and to make us accept things when there's so many people out there say, well, I don't really want to accept this, but I don't know what to do. They're waiting for somebody to stand up. Yeah. We need to stand up. Anytime you notice something, they say, to say, you know what, I'm going to do this. Don't wait for someone else to do it. I'm going to do it. 
I'm not going to allow this to happen, and we'll see. Let the, let the cards fall where they may. Let the chips fall where they may. I'm going to stand up. I'm going to do this. And if you're with me, come with me. Get on board. We're going to serve the Lord. And if not, then go worship Baal. But we're going to make the, you make a decision, and, and this is the way things are going to be. We're not going to allow these altars of Baal to be reared up, and if they're reared up, we're going to tear them down. Let's bow our heads on a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for your word. God, I pray that you please give us the boldness. Give us the, um, the spirit, dear God, from you to not wait on others when things need to be done. When there's, when there's problems in our community, when there's problems in our areas, dear Lord, that you would, and even in our personal lives, dear God, when, when, these, when these Baal worshiping images and idols and things creep into our own houses, Lord, help the, the, the fathers, especially the husbands, the people that, that, that ought to be taking the lead in their family, dear Lord. Help us to, to get rid of the wickedness out of our house. Lord, that, it, that it's not going to cleave unto us and cause us to get into sin. God, help us identify the wickedness and just to stamp it into powder and get it out of our house and out of our lives, dear Lord. Anything that's going to turn us away from serving you. God, I pray that you would please just strengthen us tonight. Strengthen and build this church. God, give us all hearts that are, that are uh, willing and fervent to serve you, dear God. And help us not to forget these messages today, dear God. Help us to walk out and, and to be thinking about them when, and when situations arise. Not to be forgetful hearers. Not just to fall back into that comfortable state of saying, well, I don't really know what to do, so I'm not just going to do anything. God, help us to, to be strong. Help us to have the courage. Help us to prepare and put on our spiritual armor, dear Lord. That, that you've laid out for us that we need to have. And uh, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.